Hi, everyone. My name is Rob Busher, and I am the JACL Philadelphia chapter president and also the curator of the Third Space uh, exhibit about the resettlement of Japanese Americans in greater Philadelphia. Uh, I'm joined here today by Bryant Gersh. Brian, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Brian Gersh. Um, I am one of two co-directors at Da Vinci Art Alliance, which is an art gallery and community space in South Philadelphia. Uh, but more importantly today, um, I've been working with Rob to help build uh, the third space. And so uh, we're going to be sharing uh, a short little walkthrough and preview of the space today and talking about um, what happened, how we made it, and uh, what some things we're going to be looking at. Great. Thanks, Brian. Um, so this exhibit came about after a couple of years of research, a, a project that kind of started in 2017, actually, uh, as we began looking at the history of Japanese American resettlement in the post-war era uh, here in greater Philadelphia, as well as Southern New Jersey. So there's a lot of uh, conflicting information between what the government narrative was of obviously wartime incarceration and the post-war resettlement. And we felt that it would be necessary to kind of delve into community perspectives, uh, first through the exploration of, of narrative and history, and specifically some of the stories that were told in a series of articles for Pacific Citizen. But as we began doing this research, uh, I kind of realized that the visual image has a lot to do with the ways that the Japanese American community interpreted their experience during this time of resettlement and wanted to try and bring this into a gallery setting. So we were actually in conversation with Da Vinci Art Alliance about doing a, a physical exhibit in the gallery space that would explore some of this through uh, photography and, and as well as some home movie footage. But unfortunately with the COVID pandemic, uh, we've had to shift things into a, a virtual space. Um, and thankfully uh, with Bryant's skill set as a programmer, we were able to make that pivot pretty seamlessly into uh, this incredible virtual experience that um, I think is probably easier to show than to talk about. So Brian, why don't you go ahead and, and share cool. the, the screen? Great, I'll jump right into that. Um, so what we're gonna be looking at uh, is, as Rob said, um, a kind of virtual experience that is interactive. And so right now we are looking at uh, my computer as I am in the space um, playing this video game. Um, and I call it a video game uh, simply because um, it's made in Unity, which is a program built for, well, making video games. And so we made this virtual space in Unity um, over, over a couple months uh, to resemble um, aspects of, um, of these resettlement camps. Um, and so I'm able to move around the space uh, using my computer um, with the WASD keys for forward, back, left, and right, and then also my mouse while looking around. So combining those two movements, I am able to kind of simulate walking through this uh, desert environment uh, as we explore uh, this camp exhibition space. Yeah, so the, the choice to uh produce this particular environment was made based on a composite of several of the desert camps. It's not meant to represent any one of the camps specifically, knowing that there would be obvious challenges in terms of historical accuracy in both the layout, the architecture, the design. But what we're trying to convey here is an approximation of what a war relocation authority relocation site looked like. Um, for the purpose of kind of putting us in the shoes of uh, incarcery um, and also the mindset of someone who's lived through this experience and how those experiences are then translated into the post-war resettlement. So in terms of the actual layout, we're in a residential barracks block. Um, the exhibit spans across actually nine barracks. And what we have on the left-hand column is a series of four barracks that explore the wartime incarceration and post-war resettlement through the government lens of propaganda, largely through photographs that were taken by War Relocation Authority photography section photographers, as well as a uh, video propaganda clip that we're going to be looking at just momentarily. On the right-hand side, in the opposite column, we have four barracks 
that interpret these experiences through the eyes of Japanese American community members who either smuggled or were given permission to have video and phot photography cameras in the camps, as well as the post-war resettlement. And so looking at how these two experiences differ, depending on who is behind the lens of the, pho the photo camera, we can start to see how the Japanese American community interpreted this experience differently than the government narrative that surrounds it. Um, and the final barrack, which we'll be looking at at the very end of this uh, demonstration, also contains some of the original artworks that were created by resettlers who came here to Greater Philadelphia. Um, so why don't we go ahead and get started by taking a look at the first barrack in the left-hand column. And this barrack has an excerpt from a film called Japanese Relocation. It was produced by the Office of War Information in collaboration with the War Re Relocation Authority. Relocation Center. Evacuees were met by an advanced contingent of Japanese who had arrived some days earlier and who now acted as guides. Naturally, the newcomers looked about with some curiosity. They were in a new area on land that was raw, untamed, but full of opportunity. Here they would build schools, educate their children, reclaim the desert. Special emphasis was put on the health and care of these American children of Japanese descent. So as you get closer to this projector and the screen, uh, more of the audio from that particular video clip comes in. Uh, in total, it's only about a three or four minute clip of a much larger 15 minute documentary newsreel. Um, and we felt that this was a particularly important clip in terms of showing uh, how the government was trying to convey through euphemistic language, the incarceration experience. So if we turn around uh, to the opposite barrack, we can actually see how one in incarcery interpreted this experience directly through home movie footage that was taken on a Kodak color chrome home movie camera at Topaz camp, uh, Dave Tatsuno, who was one of the major community leaders, uh, was able to get this footage shot. We can uh, take a look. And Rob, you said that um, some of the folks in here were allowed to have video cameras, but others smuggled them in. Which, which uh, on the side of this is Dave? So Dave uh, initially had brought a camera to camp uh, and didn't know if he'd be allowed to use it, but then actually was given permission. He was involved in the dry goods store and the co-op. So he actually did buying trips outside of camp. He traveled the country uh, outside of the military exclusion area. And on his trips, he would frequently pick up uh, more reels of the color film foot so that he could continue documenting his experience in camp. Cool. Well, let's take a look then. Arid. And Topaz snowbound. You can see how cold it was in Topaz. And all we had were the army potbelly stoves. Most of the people who were in Topaz were from the Bay Area, so they were not quite used to the weather. They have now announced that the coast is reopened to evacuees from January the 15th of 1945. And so this is the relocation uh, of the, or leave taking of the evacuees going back to their homes. And naturally, those who had homes to go back to were the first ones who were able to leave Topaz, and they're leaving Topaz in this fashion. So the, the footage that Dave shot uh, over the period of time that his family was at Topaz uh, shows a lot of the daily life and interactions, the reality that the incarcerees were facing comparative to the very euphemistic footage and language that's used in the government propaganda reels we get to see some of the challenges related to the weather, the climate, as well as uh, just some of his personal thoughts about the incarceration. So uh, definitely a very different perspective. And um, through color film footage, we also get to see something that's closer to what the community was experiencing. Uh, and I think it makes it a little more accessible to contemporary audiences. 
So um, at this point, let's go ahead and, and start by taking a look at the three barracks left here in the, the left column that show how the government interpreted both the camp experience and the post-war resettlement. Now, uh, a number of these photographs um, are, are known popularly. Uh, these are the photos that were made to public through uh, publications like Life Magazine uh, during World War II, and certainly in a number of, of government-sponsored uh, news publications that try to show the incarceration experience as uh, something that's being done for the community's safety, something that is a, a minor inconvenience to their daily lives, uh, where the community is willingly making this sacrifice in order to um, show their loyalty and, and for the greater good of America. Um, and so by nature, the kinds of photographs that we see that are, are taken here try to emphasize the, the usual daily activities that you might see like high school dances, uh, paper flower making, um, the playing in a, a creek bed uh, outside of the camp. And, you know, gone from the image are any references to barbed wire, to the uh, armed guards. Uh, we see America's pastimes of baseball and football explored through some of the photographs here. And these are all things that happened in the context of camp, of course. But at the same time, it sort of neglects the reality of uh, what the Japanese American community was facing um, in terms of the gross uh, injustice of civil liberties. And so comparative to these photographs that show the lighter side of incarceration, um, you know, a lot of the other photos that we'll see in the community side later in this presentation really challenge that narrative uh, by looking at some of the detailed and nuances uh, that made this a difficult experience for people. Um, in this next barrack, we have the same agency, War Relocation Authority, uh, photography section, documented the post-war resettlement of Japanese Americans. And the intention with these photos in greater Philadelphia in particular was because it was the first major city on the East Coast to reopen for Japanese Americans coming out of camp. Um, they wanted to showcase a, a variety of people from different professions and walks of life in, integrated back into the job place um, in regular uh, civilian society. So uh, th this is actually probably one of the more natural photos that we see here showing the Dewey Wright Quintet singing spirituals to a group of Japanese American resettlers at the Philadelphia Hostel. And, um, you know, these are, are images of also daily life that we can see throughout the barracks, such as the uh, job postings up in the local WRA office in Center City, Philadelphia. Um, the groups of American Friends Service Center who are showing where exactly in Philadelphia Japanese Americans are relocated. Um, and other um, more casual photos that uh, clearly are, are very staged, right? So um, although the, the Nisei resettlers certainly would have enjoyed their free time, um, some of the compositions uh, and the expressions on people's faces uh, it's very heroic, it's very uh, happy, uh, energetic. Um, it, there's no uh, impact or reference of the impact of what the incarceration experience has done. And these photos are really meant to uh, essentially show the American public that the Japanese American community is just fine and that uh, they, they can be back into civilian society without so much as a hiccup uh, after this wartime incarceration. Um, and then in the, the final barrack in this column is a group of photos taken also by the WRA at Seabrook Farms. And so Seabrook Farms, uh, located about 45 minutes uh, southeast of Greater Philadelphia, was a major employer in the post-war era of Japanese Americans. Uh, some 300 Japanese American families were actually brought there during and after World War II to fulfill a labor crisis uh, shortage. And we can see in the photos of this particular uh, farm operation, Seabrook was the largest frozen food 
shipping and packing company in the United States. They had a lot of government contracts. And uh, so a, a lot of labor is required. And we, we see the same kinds of staged photos um, in the workplace as we saw in the Philadelphia context, but here in, in kind of the more rural and then the agricultural factory setting of Seabrook Farms. Um, of course, because this was family resettlement, we also see a number of the, the domestic scenes uh, as the families begin resettling in Seabrook, Bridgeton and uh, Upper Deerfield, the two towns close by to Seabrook Farms, they had to build brand new housing. And uh, speaking to some of the survivors and, and uh, uh, people who are still alive and living in or around Seabrook, um, they have memories of housing that, although it was certainly better than the barracks of the camps, um, were still very uh, staid and uh, the kinds of architecture re reflected this, um, I guess, more government sanctioned way of, of living. Um, but again, we see kind of these, these happy expressions and these scenes of uh, children and young college students uh, adjusting back into life after the camps um, without much reference of, of hardship. Um, so by comparison, why don't we take a look at some of the photographs that were actually taken by Japanese Americans, both during the camp experience as well as the post-war. Um, as I had mentioned earlier in this presentation, there were some photographers who were given permission by camp authorities to take photos. Uh, that includes Toyo Miyatake, one of the best known Japanese American photographers. He had a, a portrait studio in Little Tokyo, Los Angeles before the war and afterwards he resumed that business. But um, you know, aside from him, there, there were others who were either amateur photographers or other professionals who smuggled cameras in, who um, didn't initially have permission from the authorities. But as the war went on and they realized that there was no uh, immediate danger of Japanese Americans, uh, people were allowed to have film and even cameras shipped into them from mail order catalogs. But the kinds of scenes that we see in these photos are very different from what the government was showing us. We see Japanese cultural traditions like the Obon, the Bonodori, Buddhist uh, dance, dancing at the festival here. Um, and of course, Miyatake's famous cutting barbed wire. Um, is, this kind of image is very editorial. And so, you know, both in terms of the subject matter, as well as these more intentional choices by the photographers, we get to see this kind of critique on the incarceration, uh, particularly, you know, here's another Miyatake photo of boys behind barbed wire that again, really emphasizes the injustice of this when you see these three young men um, and a guard tower behind them. Um, but it wasn't just the professional photographers who had these kinds of ideas. These color photos were taken by Bill Monbo, who is a member of the photography club at Hart Mountain Incarceration Center in uh, Cody, Wyoming. Um, and these are photos of uh, his son and other community members um, kind of engaged in, again, daily activities uh, that most Americans would be in, in the Boy Scouts, right? And in a parade carrying the American flag. Um, we have another photo that is definitely more editorial of his young son, Billy or Takao Mambo, clutching a barbed wire fence, similar to what Miyatake did. Uh, really interesting to see that forced perspective and, and the scope and the size of the camp that they were living in. Uh, Heart Mountain overnight became the third largest city in the state of Wyoming with 13,000 residents. So uh, another one of his images that really shows something we don't see in the government narrative, the, the guard towers, which were complete with armed guards and uh, at least in the beginning of the incarceration uh, guns that were pointing inwards towards the people. Um, so I think, you know, uh, another photographer, Jack Muro, who, who was a professional uh, news photographer for some time, and then later went on to, uh, um, you know, take these photos in camp. Uh, he actually took these without the consent of the um, camp administrators initially. And I think that's part perhaps of why the images are as critical as they are. Um, but again, you know, we still have these uh, 
kind of daily interactions, the types of, of portraits and photos of family members and children that we might see in any other location, um, but in the context of a, a prison camp. So I, I think, you know, there's some very interesting uh, perspectives that we can kind of see here of the community uh, trying to sustain itself through various cultural traditions. Um, some of the hardships, for example, like uh, gathering coal to heat the, the drafty barracks. Um, and then other, uh, you know, daily images uh, that people would have been encountering um, within the context of their confinement. So um, this other photo by Jack Munro, you know, we can kind of see maybe the uh, the tongue in cheek humor of a United We Stand banner inside of one of the administration offices um, and just kind of the context of being in, in a, a government sponsored prison camp uh, for being of a specific ethnicity or race um, definitely is in direct opposition to that kind of statement. Um, and then lastly, an, another image of the uh, Amachi camp from a water tower actually showing the scope of the camp, which is something that you don't really get to see a lot of um, in the government photos. So Rob, um, we've been looking at a lot of these photographs um, from the Japanese American community. Where did these come from? Like where are the actual photographs uh, sourced from? So the, uh, the ones that we just looked at were from a number of archival sources, including the Hart Mountain Wyoming Foundation, Japanese American National Museum, as well as the Toyo Miyatake Studios, but they've also been crowdsourced. And so the, the next two barracks that we're gonna be looking at of the Philadelphia community photos, as well as the Seabrook community photos, um, demonstrate the kinds of opposition um, to maybe like a, a more stylized, specific kind of photography, um, things that are really uh, daily images of life, but in the context of um, the post-war resettlement, I think gives newfound appreciation to the challenges that these families were navigating at this time period. Um, and so all of these were crowdsourced. Um, on this wall, we have a number of photographs featuring Mira Nakashima, uh, as well as her father and mother, um, George and Marion Nakashima. The Nakashima Woodworkers is one of the very famous uh, Japanese American businesses that uh, originated here in, in the greater Philadelphia area in New Hope, Pennsylvania. Um, and so Mira continues the traditions of her father, but um, the really intimate photos that uh, showcase different aspects of their integration back into this environment. Um, in, in these two photos, we see uh, Grace Kaneda uh, was her maiden name, and Uehara was her married name. Uh, one of the luminaries of the Japanese American community who was an uh, absolute leader within the redress community, uh, redress movement rather, to uh, achieve the apology and monetary recompense from the US government um, in the 1980s. But we see these images from her earlier life uh, as she was resettling uh, here in Philadelphia, becoming a social worker and engaging in various causes, uh, pictured here on the right-hand side with her husband, Hiroshi, uh, another important Nisei leader who was uh, instrumental during the early years of resettlement um, at one of the folk fairs uh, that used to be hosted here in Philadelphia. Um, you know, and then looking at some of these other images, we, we tried to think about, you know, who was the community uh, beyond just this, the singular families. And we were lucky to um, have some photos of community gatherings that took place on the Moriuchi apple orchard. Tak Moriuchi was uh, the, the largest uh, apple orchard uh, here on, on the East Coast. Um, this is Tak, Tak Moriuchi with his daughter Mio. Um, in one of the fields. But in the post-war era, he became quite famous in this region as a successful business owner who hired a lot of other Japanese Americans coming out of the camps and it gave them uh, a, a safe place to live and, and earn a, a living. Um, and for many years afterwards, you know, hosted community gatherings uh, in their uh, properties. Um, 
and I, I think you know this this understanding of like children and generations is, is really important too you know thinking again how many of these photos are family photos like any of us would have um, in a given time period but the context of um, the sort of hardships and also the trauma that people are still trying to recover from. Um, we have this very sort of intentional understanding by placing such images within the context of the barracks um, that, you know, to get to these points, they had to endure the wartime incarceration. And ultimately, uh, as they were navigating life in the post-war era, this sort of trauma and perhaps stigma of the wartime incarceration is something that continued to stay with them um, throughout the rest of their lives. Um, but again, um, looking at not just uh, Philadelphia as a city, but also some of the surrounding areas. Um, these were some photos that were provided by Ed Kobayashi showing his uh, childhood and adolescence in Cape May, New Jersey. Um, but again, uh, very similar images as we might see to any American family of any ethnicity or race uh, in this time period, um, but shown in the context of this kind of experience. Um, you know, and, and some of these photos also reveal the, the challenges, right? And um, sometimes the, the dire financial straits that people found themselves in, having had their livelihoods taken from them and then suddenly being resettled in places uh, that you know, had few job prospects, even in the post-war era. Um, and then, you know, other, other images that we found uh, that, that are of luminaries like uh, William Maritani, um, the first Japanese American judge east of the Mississippi, who uh, was part of the Congressional Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment Camps, played a pivotal role in helping to author personal justice denied the, uh, the report that that commission did that essentially laid the groundwork for the redress to occur, uh, pictured here with his family. Um, so in the, the last photo, photo barrack, uh, we have a similar assortment of photos taken um, around Seabrook Farms in Bridgeton, New Jersey, Upper Deerfield and, and that area of Southern New Jersey. Um, they kind of demonstrate, again, the, the similar challenges uh, as well as the, the joys of uh, having families in this time period, navigating the circumstances that they were forced into, um, showing kind of the successes of, of being able to have home ownership after camp. And once the, the JACL and other community organizations were successful in passing the Immigration and Naturalization Act, going to citizenship classes, uh, some of the, the Issei elders that um, are, aren't featured as frequently in the Philadelphia photos, we see a lot of them here in the Seabrook community. Um, we also see images, again, of sort of the pastoral uh, any town USA, uh, predominantly Japanese American baseball team sponsored by Seabrook Farms, or at the Methodist Church in Bridgeton, New Jersey, this all Japanese American congregation on a farm road that looks like uh, just about any place in middle America. Um, from these images, we see both the, the fact that, uh, again, you know, Japanese Americans are Americans, right? And so the travesty of this uh, experience uh, that they endured during World War II. Um, but then also we get to see the kind of cultural context that was um, really continued to celebrate the aspects of traditional Japanese culture despite the fact that uh, their communities had been uh, affected so by this perception that Japanese Americans were not loyal Americans. Um, but again, uh, Im images like this of, of sort of Americana, uh, here's Aiko Nakawatase in her Seabrook Farms uniform. Uh, and we see, uh, again, just a, a quiet moment of a family lobster boil. But these kinds of images, I think, uh, again, speak to the, the larger experience and the context of what it was like for families to try and navigate these situations. Uh, I love this one in particular for the, the Pepsi Cola on the tables here. Um, this is one of the, the many JACL chow mein dinner fundraisers that were held uh, throughout the decades that the Japanese American community had resettled here. Um, 
Yeah. So uh, comparative to Philadelphia, a lot of the traditional culture was um, maintained, I think, in, in ways that um, were quite uh, intergenerational in Seabrook. There were a number of younger children uh, and now those who remain in the southern New Jersey area continue to practice uh, these traditions through organizations like the Seabrook Mino Dancers and Hodaiko, the Taiko drum troupe that's affiliated with the Seabrook Buddhist Temple. Um, to my knowledge, uh, the only Japanese American Buddhist temple in New Jersey is still located in Bridgeton, New Jersey. So uh, it really kind of shows maybe some of the differences uh, between both the Philadelphia and the uh, Seabrook rural New Jersey resettlement experience here. Um, so we can go into the, the final barrack now in this column. Um, as you've noticed, the, the two barracks that are opposite of each other in, in each row juxtapose the images directly, right? So um, whatever we're talking about in Philadelphia resettlement or Seabrook resettlement, we have the government perspective on one side and the community perspective on the other. But in this final barrack, uh, we actually see some of the original artworks that were created by Japanese Americans during the resettlement. And I think perhaps um, this is one of the most interesting ways to kind of understand how people were navigating this experience. Um, in a lot of ways, uh, the experience was so difficult that uh, people in the camp years found ways through arts and craft to navigate that experience, to persevere through their pursuit of creativity. And some people like George Nakashima came out of camp uh, with a skill set. He was an architect prior to World War II. Um, he had an interest in woodworking, but by studying with a, a Japanese carpenter craftsperson in, uh, in Minidoka camp where they were incarcerated together, he came out of it with a skill set and an admiration for woodwork that uh, changed the trajectory of his entire career in the post war era. And he became one of the most celebrated furniture designers and uh, woodworkers of uh, modern furniture design in the post war era. Um, we see, you know, other uh, arts that are, I think, maybe not as traditional, right? The, the art of farming. Um, the, this is absolutely a very traditional art form uh, across the world. But then also the, the photography itself and the sort of artistry that's being shown here um, beyond the kinds of family photos that we saw earlier. Um, here are some very intentional ways to make us see, I think, the apple orchard in the perspective of a ukiyo-e as we might be looking at a sakura blossom in uh, earlier uh, pre-modern Japan. Um, and then of course uh, in Seabrook during the the resettlement there were a number of uh, arts uh, classes that were being uh, practiced within the community. Uh, a series of painting classes were offered to resettlers and so some of the these all of these works were created by individuals that were living there and adjusting to this new environment in an almost documentary form, uh, capturing the images of their daily life in both rural New Jersey, as well as these very barrack looking housing complexes that were built for them uh, by the Seabrook Farms. So I think here we can really see those similarities between the housing in the camp and the housing in uh, Seabrook Farms area, uh, perhaps uncomfortably similar and familiar to a lot of the individuals who just spent the last two or three years living in a, a prison camp. Um, and then lastly, you know, we kind of see some more traditional arts here with this uh, incredibly detailed uh, paper folding and uh, needlepoint artwork here um, that have more traditional subjects, but again, kind of being done in the context of the post-war resettlement uh, leads to some sort of interesting questions about uh, sort of the intentional reclamation of culture um, and maybe a question of to how much that is being done in resistance. Um, and I, I think uh, a lot of the work that we've seen in the context of this exhibit demonstrates um, exactly how the community itself has interpreted their experience in ways that were very different 
uh, in some cases in direct opposition to the WRA and the other government entities. Um, but as we mentioned um, at the beginning of this presentation, this is a, a virtual experience and you are able to explore it on your own. Um, anyone uh, who has access to this video should have access to the Da Vinci Art Alliance website uh, where you can access the, the playable version of this virtual experience and explore it on your own time uh, in your own detail. So, um, you know, with, with all of that being said, I just wanted to, again, thank Da Vinci Art Alliance and, and thank Bryant, who's done a fantastic job uh, helping to actualize this vision and, and really so much of the creative design process was in his, hand, his capable hands. So we really appreciate all that he's done for us. But uh, this exhibit was co-sponsored by the JACL Philadelphia and Seabrook chapters. Uh, we received funding support from the JACL Legacy Fund grant, as well as the National Park Service uh, Japanese American Confinement Sites grant. So we wanted to say thank you to our funders and um, I hope that you will uh, take your time to, to really view this virtual exhibit. Uh, there are also some materials on the website uh, PDFs of brochures and other documents that were provided to the Japanese American community uh, as folks began to leave camp and, and decided to resettle in Philadelphia specifically. So uh, please take your time to read through those uh, resources and uh, thank you for watching this video. Thanks so much, everyone, for uh, tuning in with us. Um, if you want to play along with yourself, um, the link to um, this exhibition and all of the information that goes along with it will be in the description of this video if you're not already uh, watching this video from the site that you're currently on. Um, so anything else to add there, Rob? I think that's everything. All right. Well, thanks so much, everyone.